Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is in James chapter 3, 1 through 12. You can find that on page 1883. Heading says, Taming the Tongue. Not many of you presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take, a ships, uh, take ships, for example. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes, a, but it makes great boats. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and itself sets, uh, sets on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and, tamed and are tamed by men. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise the Lord our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water uh, flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. You will, of course, keep your Bibles at an opening in James chapter 3 that Nick read. You know, there was a time that Nick wouldn't do that. <laughs> and it's such, such an excellent job. Of course, I know the buzz and what everybody's talking about, and that is the idea that you're leaving already. I am. I'm, as you're aware, that my, both my parents are struggling with cancer, and the days when my father is numbered. And uh, my mother starts chemo tomorrow. And so the elders have graciously given me a three months family leave. And so I'll be leaving on the 31st to go down there. Karen, who looks like might join me about a week later, but we covet your prayers, but I am extremely thankful to the elders and to you for allowing me to take this time. It is so very important, precious and needed. And so I'm thankful for that a great deal. I do want to encourage you and wish you a happy new year since I will be here next Sunday. But also encourage you, if you will, to think about taking that challenge to read through scripture. I was talking to somebody in California, counseling her uh, yesterday. And, um, you know, there were some things I was encouraging her to put into place. And two things I want you to understand is, is that Bible study is one thing. Reading God's word is something different. It's not the same. And you really need to do both. You need to just read God's word because it will speak to you and let it flow and keep it in context. And it will flow and, and understand it better. And then you need to study it. You need to do both. And I want to encourage you to take that challenge and go through. And you know, it's, you don't know, have to follow the program. But there's two things about it. Number one, sometimes there's more reason to stay on track if you know other people are in the same <coughs> place. But it's also something we're doing together as a family. So join in, join them together. Uh, if you're in the, um, use the app, those of us who are more technically advanced in our phones, then uh, just use the app and look for uh, 360 <coughs> Live and find it in there. Let's go to God and pray. Lord, we're so very thankful how much you love us. We thank you, dear Lord, for this precious time to be together, and we ask, dear Lord, for your continued care. Lord, as we approach a new year, we ask, dear Lord, that we truly have a focus, 
It's a time and date for us to think about and evaluate our lives from the past, but also to look forward and to evaluate the things that we need to do to align ourselves closer to you. We are so very thankful, dear Lord, that when we made that choice to be your children, that we committed to an ongoing process of transformation. And we realize, dear Lord, that it is both exciting and scary. But we're thankful, dear Lord, that you do the transforming as we continue to submit to you. And we pray, dear Lord, that that will take place as we go about this new year. Now, truly, dear Lord, we move forward being the people we need to be. We ask, dear Lord, and I ask that you continue to be the body here, continue to be with Jerry and Jim as they lead, and pray, dear Lord, you bless them with wisdom. And we ask, dear Lord, for your continued strength. For truly, dear Lord, as we face our lives, we will face challenges. But we know, dear Lord, that as we rest in your arms, that truly, dear Lord, you give us a strength. And when we come out the other side, we are better for. Lord, in all things, we give you glory. We thank you, dear Lord, for your mercy and grace. We thank you, dear Lord, for your precious spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are traveling together in the book of James. I do want you to understand I'm going to pick that up three months from now. And so if you're preaching within the next three months, hands off of James. Okay. <laughs> All right, but we're going to study together in this book, of course, we've been, we're in chapter three, which is a very, very practical chapter to start the new year. You know, one of the James things that James gets across is, over and over again, is that Christian walk, Christianity is not about doing religious acts, but it's about committing to a process of transformation, of change. And James gets across here in a very pointed way that victorious living requires that we keep a tight rein on our tongues. Not easy. You know, so much destruction and heartache is brought about by the mean and hateful things that we say. And we need to realize that when those things come out, you can't take them back. You'd like to, you can't rope them in, you can't take them back. You can ask for forgiveness, but guess what? It still takes a toll on your relationship. It's still there. And so the point is that James is going to stress a great deal, is the idea is that we need to be more proactive and think about what we're going to say before we actually mouth it. I mean, James thinks that this is so important that he's already addressed it once. Remember what he said there? He said, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because for a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. You hear what he says? He says, already the first thing you need to do is shut up. And then listen. And keep a handle on your anger. That we've got to keep a tight rein on, you've got to keep a tight rein on how you talk, your communication. And it's so important to James. So important. You keep in mind, he's writing to Christians that, you know, he had eldered and shepherded in Jerusalem. It's so important to him that he comes back to this topic now and expounds on it when we get here to chapter 3. So he starts off chapter 3 by saying, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Not many of you should presume to be teachers. That's a scary passage for me. Because anyone who claims to be a teacher is going to be under much stricter judgment. You know, the, the role of a teacher or a rabbi in Judaism and early Christianity was often a very honorable role. Jesus proudly 
saw himself as a teacher. <clears throat> but James must have got across the idea that there were some within the body that were taking on this role of teacher, maybe not so much for the purpose of teaching, but maybe more of notoriety and honor, attention. And James says, if you're going to take on this role, role you better not do so lightly. I mean, all of us can sin with the tongue. He'll go on with that. But we are particularly vulnerable as teachers because of our influence. There's a person that said one time, and I think they're absolutely right, teachers should both practice what they preach and preach what they practice. And it's so very important I'm very, very conscious of it that we need to be careful before we take that mantle on. But then he goes on to say to something much more general to most of us. In verse 2. It says, We all stumble in many ways. If anyone's never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. So James starts off and says that a person who's able to keep a tight rein on his tongue is perfect. Now the Greek word is teleos. And when it uses the word here, it's not talking about someone who is sinless, but someone who is spiritually mature. Someone who is spiritually developed. Someone who's complete spiritually. And he says, if you're mature, fully developed spiritually, then you keep a tight rein on this two-ounce slab that gets us in so much trouble. <laughs> he said, then, if you're able to do that, if you're able to keep your tongue in check, then it is a sign of your spiritual growth and development. And, of course, the inverse is also true, unfortunately, if we continue to find that we strike out with our tongues in anger, then maybe we're not as mature spiritually as we think we are. Because we need to realize that being a child of God, and James is getting across this very clearly in this text, that being a child of God is about more than going to church. It's more than being good morally, it's also about watching how and what we say to others. It's interesting how much scripture says about that in our relationships. <clears throat> Solomon noted in Proverbs 18, verse 21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So James says, I really need to get this point across. Look how he gets there, we're starting there in verse 3. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. You hear what James is saying? James is saying is, don't ever think what you say is no big deal. He says that it's a small member of your body, but it's going to do a lot. He says, I'll give you an example. You have this massive horse, but guess what? That bit that's in his mouth can direct him. So take a ship, for instance. This massive ship, even in a storm, can be controlled by a small rudder. 
Our words and what we say are powerful and destructive. And I don't know whoever came up with sticks and stones, break my bones, the words will never hurt me. Because that's a complete lie. <laughs> they do more harm than any sticks or stones that come about. They are destructive. And we better not play down or make excuses for the harm they inflict. You know, just a side note. You realize that no matter what someone says, you don't have to answer in kind. That's a child. A child will answer in kind. You know, someone strikes after you, you strike back. No, God says you can control. You can hold the reins of the tongue. You can be that person who is teleos, mature. <laughs> New Living Translation put verse 5 this way. In the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. It can cause so much harm. <clears throat> fire starts by a little thing. You know the fire, the Chicago fire? of 1871, started old Larry's barn when a cow kicked over a lamp. He realized from that small incident that 100,000 people became homeless. Do you realize that 17,500 buildings burned? 300 people died? $400 million in that time in damage? from just a little old cow in old Larry's barn kicking over a lamp. <laughs> you don't think that happens when it comes to the tongue? <clears throat> you don't think it ha doesn't happen when there's harmful words said or gossip that's spread? <clears throat> or hurtful words that can destroy your relationship can destroy a family, can destroy a church. That's the power that's there that we need to realize that God calls upon us to keep a tight rein on it. Look what it goes on to verse 6. It says, The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, set the whole course of his life on fire, and is self set on fire by hell. What we say can be so destructive and end up in our own demise. James says the origin of this evil is hell, Satan's greatest tool that he uses all too often to both destroy our relationships and us is the tongue. What we say. New Living Translation put verse 6 this way, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It's full of wickedness that can ruin the whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, and for it is set on fire by hell itself. James then goes on to say, verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. So James saying, oh, you can tame animals. But you can't tame the tongue. And a tamed animal, of course, you know, you can let it go and it's not going to do any destruction. You're freely wrong, but you can never take the reins off your tongue. You've always got to keep it in check. Because no matter how mature you are spiritually, if you let go of the reins, it'll run. <laughs> 
It'll run and do damage when you don't even expect it. Because, see, James is getting across, it's something we've constantly got to monitor. It's not going to become automatic. You're always going to have to be conscious of it. And be vigilant. He says it's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. It's interesting there. The Greek word used for restless is the same word used in chapter 1 for being unstable spiritually. It says there in James 1, verse 7 and 8, the man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded man. That word unstable there is the same word restless here. And all he does. So James is reminding us that not only are we unstable spiritually if we're double-minded. Remember that double-minded man in chapter 1 was this man who prays and is praying to God but not willing to trust God. It's double-minded of two minds. But he says also that our profession of faith is not real. It's not stable. If our speech does not match that profession. He goes on to say in verse 9, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Again, James is going to cross. Being religious and being faithful are two different things. I mean, if you come to worship, claim to be a Christian, come to worship, praise God here, but you go throughout the week being hurtful and destructive with your tongue, James is saying that that profession of faith is worthless. It means nothing. It is not being played out in your life as it goes along. You're just that hypocrite, that person who puts on that mask of being his. But if we go home and at the marketplace or at work or at home, that we see, say mean and hateful things, that we are destructive with our language and our tongue, then you may be religious, but you're fooling yourself. You think you're being faithful. Because it's not coming, it's not playing out. It says, it says it doesn't match. You can't praise God and curse men in the same hand. He goes on to really illustrate that. Beginning in verse 9, backing up there, it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? <clears throat> My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or an olive vine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. See, James is saying this inconsistency between the profession of faith and how we live and talk should not exist. That we should be people, because he said, guess what? Fresh salt water and fresh water cannot flow from the same spring. You're either or. Either you're a person who is fetching that faith and striving. Now keep in mind, the reins of those tongue to the best of us always get away sometimes. But if we continually, if we're not willing and striving to try to keep control on it, hold those reins. Then he's saying, you're not displaying that which is truly 
faithful. He said, can a fig tree produce olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? He said, because a salt spring cannot ever produce fresh water. See, praising God and destroying people with their tongues does not mix. How we treat people, how we communicate in our relationships, he's saying, guess what? Jesus made this point. Shows the true nature of our hearts. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruits. You brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, guess what? The mouth speaks. You hear what Jesus is saying? Is no matter how you profess faith, no matter how you good about worshiping, he says, if your speech does not match what you're professing, then it's not true. Because he says, in reality, our mouth reveals what's in the heart. <clears throat> we cannot abuse people verbally, be judgmental, gossip, and please listen to this and expect to go to heaven. If this is our normal pattern of life. Again, we'll always, all of us, We'll lose a time the rains on this little slab. But if it is an ongoing practice in our lives, we are not living that transformed life. We are not living up to the profession. That's what James is saying. He's not making any points about it. You're not living a profession that you're professing before others. And the sad part is, too often we make excuses for ourselves in this area. We don't take it seriously. How we communicate with one another makes a difference to God. And so we've got to work at, and please help you, help you understand this, help me understand it, and that is yeah, we've got to work at it all the time. <laughs> you just can't forget it. You, 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 you always got to work at thinking before you speak, pausing. Think back to this week. I mean, think, think back to the week. Did your tongue get loose sometimes? Did you let go of the leash? <laughs> See, we can course. Confess that to God, ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> we will always struggle in this area James is getting across, but the point is, is that we do not accept it as being acceptable behavior, for it's not in God's sight. And so we have to continue, and we need to build in. We need to build in where we pause and think. I mean, James says, be slow to speak. I hear, shut up. <laughs> Quick to hear and slow to become angry. We've got to have long fuses. We've got to be willing to not answer in kind just because someone answers away to us. That's more pride. <clears throat> but we need to ask the questions. I mean, ask a question like, is what I'm going to say good and wholesome? Or does it display bitterness and anger? Think before we talk. Ask a question like, is what I'm going to say encouraging and uplifting? Or does it attack and tear them down? Is what I'm going to say kind and compassionate? Or is it cutting and hurtful? 
is what I'm going to say displaying forgiveness <clears throat> or is it judgmental and critical? James says, be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to become angry. It's interesting to me when you read passages through the New Testament that talk about transformation and the elements that are involved in transformation <coughs> over and over and over again, our speech comes up in this process of transformation. Paul in Ephesians 4 says, do not use foul language and abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he's identified you as one who, his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved in the day of judgment. And so it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. But instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just the God through Christ. That's forgiving you. That's what a transformed nature looks like. God is concerned that this nature is portrayed as if we are going to profess to be his children. Now, please understand this. <coughs> Sometimes things need to be said that might be unpleasant to say. And sometimes those things have to be said. But how you say them and the reason you're saving, saying them makes a world of difference. <clears throat> because if that's ever said, if you ever have to do that, and sometimes in my profession you've got to do that, you do it in love. Not out of anger, not out of spite, but in love. Because sometimes difficult things have to be said. Jesus did. He didn't make everybody happy in what he said. But all of it was done in love. The difference, James says, between being religious and being faithful is that we'll display it we displayed in our attitude and our speech. Because guess what? God's going to hold us accountable in what we say. He really is. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. <coughs> for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. Let's stand sing our song. Angry words so oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip may the heart best in ever check them Oh,
as I said, you know, as you read through Scripture, you realize that even some of the preliminary passages, when you see basically what we call a listing of sins, or really the preliminary model of transformation, that one of the first things we have to work on is our speech, our tongues. Paul, when he wrote to the congregation at Colossae, said, beginning in chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, he said, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now also you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self and its practices, and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and image of his creator. Here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barren, Scythian, slave, or free. The Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another, just as in agreements we have them against one another, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Did you hear that? Keep in mind that the transform nature, transform nature is not only where the things we stop doing, but it's the things we are adding. And he said, Artie, if you're going to display this transform nature, you're going to have to get rid of <clears throat> anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language. Okay, God, I'm working on those things. But you've got to add, look at verse 12. You've got to add compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And forbearance. It means you put up with stuff. What <laughs> forbearance? And so you've got to ask, you, am I okay? That, but is my speech compassionate? Is it kind? Is it gentle? Is it build up? See, these are the things that we've got. Because like I said, I think James realized why he came back to it, even though he made a statement about it in chapter 1. These are things that we usually sometimes just kind of slide over, you know? That's just me. You know, I just do that. It's just me. No, God says, no, Artie, it's not just you. You've got to work at transforming. <clears throat> it's a process. And at times, we'll always lose the rain. <laughs> It'll get away from us. But we need to make sure that it is not our ongoing nature. Because that's the projection of a transformed life. When we obey the gospel, this is part of the process that we've committed to. This transformation takes place in all areas of our lives. When we finally believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and because of that are willing to make a transformation, change in our lives called repentance, confess our faith, for the rest of our life before a world that does not believe. Submit to a water grave of baptism where I die and now I submit to a new nature that is ever growing and ongoing. If you had need invitation, if I should come now as we stand and sing.